the two most influential and prolific American Orientalists, who also became permanent expatriates, were Frederick Arthur Bridgman and Edwin Lord Weeks. Bridgman was born in Tuskegee, Alabama, and began his art studies at 16 years old and departed for Paris in 1866 at 19 years old. He studied for an extended period with the great Jean-Léon Jérôme and made his first of many trips to North Africa around 1872. He remained in Morocco and Algeria with only one trip to Egypt in 1873. But from that trip, Bridgman produced, quote, Towing on the Nile, a major work of a rarely seen activity along the Nile. The figural work is exquisite. Bridgman painted numerous smaller pictures like this lushly executed work entitled Babel Nazar, one of the three remaining gates into ancient Cairo. These pieces were then reference material for major salon pictures painted in his studio. Bridgman's many years in Algeria and persistence was gradually rewarded by often being allowed, quote, behind closed doors, as they say. He developed trust among the often skeptical local Arabs. Very, very few artists were allowed to enter private dwellings and capture the daily life of families, which is why so many urban images in Orientalist paintings are street scenes. Images of women doing their daily activities within their living quarters are rare. Bridgman has captured a family with the tiny children and the young mother weaving a burnous, according to the title. The scene is in the city of Biskra, roughly 250 miles from Algiers. The second scene painted in Biskra is the interior of a cafe painted in 1884, depicting a very relaxed, casual grouping of people. The standing figure appears to be a musician with some sort of flute instrument, but that's purely a guess. Further close study reveals the seated pair are playing cards. You can see each is holding cards in their hand. Scenes of card and board games were popular. The figures here appear deeply engrossed in the board game. They're playing with the interested young lady watching behind them. The artist is taking full advantage of his opportunity to paint an interior scene and depict a group of young ladies enjoying each other's company in what we would call today me time. The presence of a small child elevates the composition above our notion of a quote harem scene. Bridgman delicately approaches a courtship scene or romantic encounter in this work entitled The Rendezvous. All done in good taste, at least from the West's viewpoint. From the mid-1870s through the mid-1890s, Frederick Arthur Bridgman was highly regarded, heavily collected, and was referred to as the American Jerome. But tastes change, and even though Bridgman painted several European scenes, he was too closely associated with Orientalist subject matter. With a loss in sales and patronage, and possibly a latent fondness for gambling, he was forced to sell his palatial studio in Paris and move to Normandy. By the time of his passing in 1928, Frederick Arthur Bridgman was all but forgotten. Edwin Lord Weeks's travels, places, scene, and body of work is nothing short of staggering. Many Orientalists of the period were superbly trained and gifted artists, but few went to the extremes that Weeks did. His peer artist marveled at his skill and productivity, but considered his adventurous nature was reckless. Weeks' work was dominated by three things, the people, the architecture, and the color. 
all bathed in brilliant sunlight. Fortunately for the viewer today, Weeks identified the locations of his paintings, country, city, or specific scene. Boston born of comfortable means, Weeks first trip to Egypt and Persia was in 1870 at 21 years old and moved to Paris as a permanent expatriate in 1872. He devoted the next seven years to traveling and painting throughout North Africa and surrounding countries. While in Egypt, Weeks painted many of the traditional images of the pyramids, caravans, and scenes along the Nile. This peaceful image is likely a short way from Cairo, and a small group of women gathering near the water and possibly washing clothes. The male figures actually appear to be doing nothing, but this particular work is a stunning image painted in Cairo. The blanket trappings on the camel are exquisite, and the famous, quote, attitude on the camel's face is wonderful. Depicting an everyday scene of bargaining in a bazaar is represented by this work of a gun buyer in Morocco. The close-up clearly shows the potential purchaser carefully examining the weapon while the bickering and bargaining is ongoing. This image hints at the extent of Weeks's travels. It is entitled, A Market in Isfahan, Persia, today's Iran, painted in 1885. The close-up reveals the young artisan with hammer in hand as he works on a brass object. He is possibly apprenticing under the elderly gentleman seated next to him. Weeks's true calling that would define his career and financial well-being occurred in 1882 with his first trip to India. He discovered a vast region, every bit as intriguing as North Africa and full of subjects and places worth painting, and it was largely untouched by Western artists. Its distance from Europe and much of North Africa plus the hardships and difficulty traveling pretty much guaranteed only the most adventurous artist would attempt traveling to India. Weeks made three extended trips to India over roughly the next decade, 1882 and three, 1886 and seven, and 1891 to 1893. Here we see Weeks in his magnificent Paris studio with two massive paintings of Indian scenes. Easily overlooked, as arduous as travel to India was, once there, the travel throughout the large subcontinent was equally challenging, and yet weeks painted in virtually all the notable sites. The Ganges is the holy river of Hinduism, beginning high in the Himalaya mountains and emptying into the Bay of Bengal. Weeks's masterpiece captures its importance as seen is the holy city of Banaras along its banks. This is the pilgrimage destination over centuries for Hindus to bathe in the waters of the Ganges. The river and its tributaries impact a landmass that today affects the lives of four hundred million people, one-tenth of the world's population. Tragically, it is one of the world's most polluted rivers considered unsafe for human use. Weeks was sensitive to its deep significance to Hindus. In his monumental, quote, the last voyage, souvenir of the Ganges, Banaras, we see an elderly Hindu fakir or holy man, at the end of his life, being taken across the river to die in the holy city of Benares. In the background are figures on the steps, or ghats, gathered around a funeral pyre, cremating a body whose ashes will shortly be scattered into the river. When Weeks passed away in 1903, this was the only painting 
his wife withheld from his estate sale, and she donated it to the Metropolitan Museum in 1905. In 1956, at the height of abstract expressionism, the Met deaccessioned this piece, selling it at auction. Weeks, of course, visited Agra and painted the magnificent Taj Mahal, built in 1620 by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, which took 20 years to complete. It was a tomb for his favorite wife. I kind of wonder, what did the rest of his wives get? Travel memoirs were immensely popular at this time, and Weeks wrote his entitled From the Black Sea Through Persia and India, published in 1895. At this time, color printing was not available, so illustrations that Weeks did had to be in black and white, or grezai. This painting of the Taj was executed for that publication. Travel to India was traditionally by boat, as was Weeks' first two trips to India. His third trip, commencing in 1891, he decided to travel overland from Europe through Persia. Starting from the Turkish Black Sea port, the group encountered civil war in Afghanistan, a cholera epidemic which took the life of one of the team and close friend, the art critic Theodore Child. These events forced Weeks to alter his route and travel through Kurdistan and Persia. Weeks executed several works in Lahore, at that time in India, today in Pakistan. This is an open-air restaurant with several figures, lots of animation in the figures, and the close-up has wonderful details in the faces. The scene is set against a superbly detailed gateway entry in the distance. Weeks's fascination with the architectural details is evident in this smaller work, which quite possibly was executed plein air or right on the spot. He put more details into the building's facade than he did into the seated figures at street level. Weeks's smaller figure pieces display a lushness with brushwork, more painterly than the major salon studio painting. This is entitled Bombay Snake Charmers. The red turbans indicate the figures are likely Rajasthani. I have seen this ancient ritual performed and have been told it's not the music the cobras react to, it's actually the swaying movement of the snake charmer. A very careful examination of this photograph of Weeks in his Paris studio, surrounded by paintings, will reveal on the mid-left side the Lahore street scene just discussed, and a bit lower on the right side the Bombay snake charmers, partially obscured by the palm leaves. Exploring for a moment Weeks's skill with the less elaborate and more intimate images is this simple, deeply touching figure of an elderly man in rags. Here, Weeks captured a glimpse of commercial activity at street level with an exceptional image entitled The Vase Cellar. The detailing is superb. Again, reflecting Weeks's fascination with the buildings in India is this complex work entitled, quote, Gates of the Fortress at Agra. The detail work on this is outstanding. It's almost hypnotic. The multitude of surfaces, textures, and colors showcase his skills as an observer and an artist. Like many of the Orientalists, they spent several years in this part of the world. They experienced all sorts of sicknesses. Weeks had two near-death experiences. He passed away in 1902 at 54 years old. Both Frederick Bridgman and Harry Moore were pallbearers at his funeral in Paris. With all his success and notoriety, sadly, 
Edwin Lord Weeks felt he was never appreciated in America the way he was in Europe. As a footnote, in 1979, the University of Vermont chose to mount a retrospective on the artist, believing they would find lots of New England subject matter to discover there basically was none, an indication that academia really didn't know their history. Images of piety and prayer were of great interest among the Orientalist artists, but were perhaps the most sensitive subject matters to paint. Christianity and Islam had a long history and often contentious. When we view these works in the present day, we must remind ourselves we are looking at how this relationship was being portrayed over 160 years ago. Well, the prologue to the 19th century was the French Revolution in 1789. Among the many grievances of the people were the abuses of the church and its excesses, abundant wealth, hypocrisy, and abuse of power. Publications such as Darwin's Origin of the Species in 1859 and the philosophy of Nietzsche, the prophet of disbelief, contributed to growing atheism, nihilism, and doubt about traditional religion, and Christianity. Although it is unknown what the level of belief versus atheism was among the Orientalist artists, they nevertheless were deeply moved by the level of devout worship within the Islamic world. They produced a remarkable body of work depicting pilgrims, religious mosques, prayer, and other acts of piety. Did witnessing these acts kindle some sort of desire to acknowledge a power greater than oneself, even among the most atheistic artists. Perhaps except that man is a spiritual being. We'll never know for sure, but I suspect for many of the artists, these works were far more than just pretty pictures to paint. Because the artists were working in mostly the Muslim world, a majority of these images of faith and prayer were scenes of Islam. But within the genre can be found depictions of Christians, Jews, Hindus, and minority sects within Islam, such as the Sufi. The Muzin is the figure seen here atop the minaret of a mosque, calling the faithful to prayer five times a day. Painted by Jean-Léon Jérôme, it is perhaps the major symbol of worship in the Islamic world, largely created by Jerome, who painted works of this and similar images. This extraordinary piece is by Jean Le Comte de Nuit, entitled Arabs at Prayer. This depicts intense humility with the seated figure, probably reading the Quran, the color, light, and shadow pattern virtually invite the viewer to enter the deeply personal scene. Perhaps the classic image of Muslims at prayer for Westerners is a hundred or so Muslims bowing in unison in a mosque. Closer to reality, on any given day, Muslims will pray their own way in their own time. Islam does not have a hierarchy of priesthood like a Christian church who led the congregation in prayer. Throughout the Middle East, one can enter a mosque and witness scenes like this, men praying, others leaning against a column and resting, another quietly reading the Quran, and perhaps another even sleeping. This remarkable painting is by the Austrian artist Ludwig Deutsch, entitled The Hour of Prayer executed in 1882. The scene is in a, quote, mirab in the mosque of Sultan Qualon in Cairo. A mirab is a niche in the wall of a mosque 
which points the warshippers in the direction they should take in order to face Mecca. In the foreground is an elderly blind man with his cane, holding the hand of a young boy who is his guide. The two figures on the far right, dressed in tattered rags, are likely dervishes, whom we will discuss in a moment. Perhaps reading too much into the artist's intent, but the little boy in the foreground really appears he would rather be outside playing than inside praying. The most beautiful mosque in Cairo is the Mosque of Sultan Hassan, pictured by the American artist Henry Ferguson, most associated with the Hudson River School artists of the mid-19th century. Most mosques have inner courtyards with archway cloisters on all sides. Each side is a giant arch. Note the size of the figures at the base of the arch in the background. The impressive structure in the foreground is a fountain where the Muslims wash before prayer. You can barely see chains hanging down from the ceiling above the arch, usually with lamps attached. The figures are dwarfed by the scale of the structure. Simultaneously, intimidating and serene. The extraordinary painter of crowded street scenes, Gustav Bauernfein, who we discussed in depth in an earlier episode, painted this remarkable masterpiece entitled Jaffa Street Scene. It's included in this segment on faith because it depicts some form of ceremony among Jews and Muslims together. The figure in the front blows a ram's horn, called a shofar, associated with Jewish customs and ceremony, and he's followed by a flag bearer displaying the Star of David. Following are several flags with the crescent moon atop the flag poles, and suggestion of Arabic writing on one of the flags. The scene projects a peaceful, joyous, and festival event. One of the great symbols of the Jewish faith is Solomon's Wall, or the Western Wall, in Jerusalem, portrayed here, once again, by Jean-Léon Jérôme in 1863. It is a surviving section of the esplanade of the original Second Temple of Jerusalem. The complex history of this sacred structure, originally built in the 10th century BC, encompasses events and rulers from the Babylonians, Persians, Romans, Christian Byzantine, and Islam. Jerome brings all his remarkable skills to this work. The German artist Karl Haag painted this small watercolor in 1859, depicting an ancient tradition in Judaism. The lengthy title is a Jerusalemite shepherd winding the phylacteries for his hands. Millennia of Jewish rabbis interpreted a passage in the Old Testament that one should keep the written prayer contained in a parchment on their person, forehead or hand. These prayers are contained in a small black box called a phylacteries. The box is already on the shepherd's forehead, and he's in the act of strapping it to his hand. Both are fastened by a thong or straps. I would not have thought it possible to capture perhaps 1,000 or more people in a painting, but this remarkable work by French-Swiss artist Eugene Girardot has done that entitled, quote, The Sacred Fire of Jerusalem. It depicts a throng of Christian pilgrims inside the rotunda of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. According to tradition dating back to the fourth century, this is the site where Jesus was crucified, known as Calvary, and the empty tomb where he was buried and then resurrected. The image shows 
Christian pilgrimages, waiting their turn to enter the Shrine of Christ. Inside the Shrine are two principal rooms. The first is the site of the last station of the cross, and the second is the Chapel of the Archangel, where it is said the angel announced the resurrection of Christ. Both the interior and exterior of the church are a shrine of dizzying array of different architectural styles from various periods that tell the story of the turbulent history of the church as well as the fragmented world of Christendom and its many, many branches. Within the sepulcher, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Coptic, and other groups occupy their own separate sections, somewhat like competing stores in a shopping mall. It is a bewildering environment for the unexpected Christian pilgrim, but its awe-inspiring beauty cannot be denied. Many interpretations have been painted of the birth of Jesus Christ and the Holy Family, Joseph and Mary. This piece by French artist Luc Oliver Merson was unique within the Orientalist genre, entitled, quote, Rest from the Flight into Egypt. This work depicts an exhausted Joseph looking up towards Mary and the child Jesus resting in the arms, or technically the legs, of the Sphinx. The artist did a number of similar haunting compositions. Edwin Lord Weeks' pension for working in a grand scale could not be better represented than this scene entitled Interior of the Mosque at Cordoba, circa 1880. His composition is a more traditional representation of Muslims in prayer in a seated or bowed position. This great mosque in Cordoba, Spain, was begun in 785 when Andalusia was ruled by the Moors. Over the centuries, it was expanded, becoming a labyrinth of 600 columns and archways. After the Moors were forced out of Spain in the 15th century, this masterpiece of Islamic architecture fell under Christian control. Weeks chose to recreate the great mosque as it would have appeared during the days of the Umayyad dynasty. Reflecting Weeks' passion for architecture, he has positioned all of the figures on a low horizon, providing room to picture the columns and arches in wonderful detail. It is a masterpiece on every level. What is a whirling dervish? It's a term many of us may have heard as kids from our parents telling us to stop behaving like whirling dervishes when we were hyperactive and out of control. The answer is within the Sufi tradition or the mystical side of Islam. A majority of the world's Muslims are Sunni. Their expression of the religion is on the somber side. In mosques at prayer time, there's no music, dancing, or incense burning. Some interpret the Quran as specifically outlawing elaborate festivities. The Sufi interpret the Quran as encouraging union with God through achieving states of ecstasy. In their case, through gatherings with music, singing, dancing. Adherents to this tradition are called dervishes. These ceremonies are attended by men, women, children, even the very elderly. Also as seen here in the close-up, a group of musicians, with a few appearing to be entering a level of ecstasy themselves. Other followers may attend, seated or standing as onlookers, as the music drones on in a repetitive, hypnotic sound, individuals rise at their own choice and begin to dance in a circular motion. The intensity increases as the dancer's pace speeds up. They begin to sweat. As they approach a trance-like state, 
One or more participants may begin dancing, twirling, arms outstretched. This extraordinary work by Jean-Léon Giron, entitled The Whirling Dervish, captures the dervish entering a trance-like state. Amid the clapping and singing, figures on the sideline begin to bob their heads. The standing figures sway their bodies back and forth. Captured in this close-up, one can find a young dervish twirling. Jerome has shown the faces of these in different states of meditation or ecstasy. It is believed Jerome must have witnessed such an event to capture it with such truth. Followers of dervish practices are certainly a small minority within Islam. And still, the singular image to represent prayer is Jerome's rooftop prayer, painted in 1865. Residents of Cairo are seen on the rooftops at dawn in the morning. This painting set the standard for containing all the elements of piety, grace, dignity, devotion, and calm that made such subjects popular with artists and buyers alike. The viewer can see muezzins on each of the minarets in the background. In the far distance is the Mosque of Muhammad Ali. The feeling of community and total devotion is communicated by the figures in silhouette. In this painting, Jean-Léon Jérôme created a distinct genre within the canon of Orientalism. Jane Digby was born in 1807 into the British upper class. Brilliant, classically educated, spoke eight languages, plus fluent Arabic. Independent-minded, married four times, six children, multiple affairs and lovers throughout continental Europe, and in quotes, the mother of all scandals, end quote in the British press for decades. She was considered the most beautiful woman of the century. Lady Jane Digby fell in and out of love across Europe before finally entering the Islamic world in grand style. Her first marriage at 17 years old to a much older man, Lord Ellenborough, consistently thought of as dull and stuffy, quickly resulting in a string of affairs across Europe that are actually hard to follow. The first appears to be Prince Felix of Schwarzburg. The next was King Ludwig of Bavaria. Somewhere in here was a brief affair with her cousin, Colonel Anson. Around this time was a formal divorce from Lord Ellenborough which took an act of parliament to complete. Next came Baron von Venigen, whom she did marry, but soon started an affair with the macho Greek Count Thestakis, which ended badly in a duel between the Baron and the Count, which the Baron won, but still led to a divorce anyhow. From the Greek Count, she stepped up to an affair with King Otto of Greece, 10 years her younger. Well, when that proved less than fulfilling, Jane fell for a genuine hero and warrior, the Greek general Hatsiparos, with whom she fought in the Greek War of Independence and not as a simple bystander, but living the life of a soldier. Wherever she lived, either with a husband or a lover, she entered the social circles and hobnobbed with the elite. Her staggering beauty and total disregard for her reputation certainly helped. Europe's fascination with her continued both in what we'd call today the tabloid and other scandal publications. Eight novels were written about her during her lifetime. Balzac considered the least appealing looking man in France, modeled his character, Lady Arabella Dudley, after Jane. 
And yes, if you are wondering, it's strongly believed she had a two-week affair with him. Jane Digby's biographers acknowledge she was a true romantic, believing each new love would be the love of her life. Instead, quote, each was only another interlude. Her life was made up of such forever darting from one campfire to the next, warming herself at the flames and forever wondering why they flickered out. When the thrill of this life wore out, Jane, now approaching middle-aged and <laughs> no apparent eligible man left in Europe, set her sights on the Middle East. Lady Jane Digby arrived in the Middle East in 1853 at 46 years old and commenced visiting Jaffa, Beirut, Jerusalem, Nazareth, and even Baghdad. She was attracted mostly to Damascus, which became her home base for the next 30 years. She dreamed of visiting the ancient ruins of Palmyra, Syria, which had only been seen by one other European woman. Ignoring the pleas of the British consul not to take this journey, she arranged a caravan with an armed Bedouin escort and made her way to Palmyra. On the trip, she met the charismatic Bedouin, Sheikh Majul el Mazrab who was already married and 20 years her younger. The attraction was immediate. Her journal entry describes their first kiss with the elation of a teenager. As unique as Jane Digby was, so was Madule. He was well-educated, well-read, and wrote and spoke seven languages. Lady Jane had shown her ability to ignore the opinion of others, and apparently so was Medjul, whose tribe felt it was unfitting that a Bedouin of, quote, noble stock and pure blood should consort with a Frank. In time, her devotion to him and ability to handle the nomadic life earned the respect of the tribe. Incredibly, Jane convinced Medjul to divorce his wife. The two were married in traditional fashion, and she became Lady Jane Digby el Mazra. For the remainder of her life, they spent six months a year in the desert and six months in Damascus. Settled into their home, they would occasionally receive visits from Europeans who managed to brave the trip to Damascus and here of this unique English lady married to a Bedouin chief. In 1859, the German Karl Haag, an accomplished Orientalist, arrived in Damascus and received an invitation to visit Jane. In his later writings, Haag stated how impressed and deeply taken by Jane he was, and seeing a group of watercolors that she did of the famed ancient ruins at Palmyra, Syria, Hogg became insistent he traveled to Palmyra. The trip was organized and Hogg's paintings of the ruins are exquisite. However, his full portrait of Lady Jane Digby el Mazra captures all the majesty and genuine romance of her transition without affectation or cliche. In the body of Orientalist art, it is unlikely there are any other paintings of a European woman fully embracing and dressed in the Arab life. The translucent veil, the long braided hair, she stands radiant and queen-like with her favorite ancient ruins as the backdrop. This magnificent painting seems to be the culmination of her remarkable life's story. Hogg went on to paint her husband, who projects the strength and dignity of a remarkable, proud man. By all accounts, their marriage, despite both age and cultural differences, was a happy one. Hogg executed a number of watercolors 
while at the Palmyra site, presumably in the company of Jane. Likely they painted together. This first example is titled, The Remains of Queen Zenobia's Palace, end of quote. The artist was working principally in watercolor at the time, yet the finished work has the depth of color of an oil. This second, light-filled piece is more expansive, suggesting the size of the site, and is entitled The Southeast Corner of the Temple of the Sun. Now known as Queen of the Desert, Lady Jane continued making her six-month trips into the desert until she was 72 years old. Those who visited her from Europe and hadn't seen her for more than a quarter of a century were shocked. She had not changed in appearance, still beautiful, agile, and active. When Lady Jane Digby El Mizraou passed away at 74 years old in 1881, a Bedouin guard on horseback followed behind her coffin with Medjul at her side, made their way to the Protestant cemetery in Damascus, where she is still buried today. It is clear that for artists to devote considerable time and several trips to the regions we've been discussing took perseverance and often courage. For a woman artist, it was close to unheard of. It was hard enough just to get accepted into a European academy to study art. Yet, there were a few. One was a gifted woman artist with the unreasonably long name of Marie Elizabeth Amy Lucas Robicaire, who achieved an enviable 40-year-long career being recognized by the highest circles in French art. A description of her reads, quote, a rare example of a female artist living and working in North Africa when women were not encouraged to travel in North Africa without a chaperone, end of quote. This first image was painted in 1893 when she was 35 years old and is entitled A Caravan in Biskra, which is 248 miles south of Algiers. One can see the tent-like litters on the front and rear camels, which appear to be carrying children. Lucas Robriquet was known for painting children with great tenderness. This second work, entitled Merchant of Hens, Algeria, was certainly painted later than the previous one. The influence of Impressionism is clearly evident in thicker, more spontaneous brushwork. It is a lovely portrait of a young boy back against a wall selling chickens. The second woman artist, Elizabeth Jericho Bauman, was a determined and somewhat controversial lady. Born in Poland in 1819, studied in Germany and Italy. She married a Danish gentleman in 1846 and moved to Copenhagen in 1849. Despite paintings like this of internationally renowned Hans Christian Andersen reading to his children, she was not well received in Denmark. Danish art was at the height of, as they called it, the golden age of Danish landscape painting. And the Danish art community was totally concerned with preserving it without outside influences. Now, she had a modest success with portraits of Danish elite. Her work developed greater recognition, however, in France. Jericho Bauman looked to North Africa, making two trips, the first at 50 years old in 1869 and 70, and the second in 1874 and 5, as a woman and accompanied with an introductory letter from the Princess of Wales, she gained access to harems which men artists did not have, and she saw them as they were, not composed from fanciful imagination. This daring, even challenging work was painted 
in 1875, depicting a reclining Fellaheen woman selling pottery with the Nile in the background. Her face is uncovered, looking straight at the viewer. Her reclining position and facial features intentionally resemble the Sphinx. She is wearing diaphanous garb, not the traditional galabia, or loose-fitting garment of cotton cloth. There is a daring ambiguity in Jericho Bauman's choices. A critic of the day observed a touch of innocence yet depicted with a sensuous and provocative look which almost turns her into an object of male fantasy. And yet she's empowered by the composition depicting her similarly to the Sphinx. Elizabeth Jericho Bauman's work regularly stretched the boundaries of the day. Often, back in Denmark, selected works were quietly placed in museum vaults, intentionally out of the public's view. Women in the predominantly Muslim world were yet another and more delicate challenge for the Orientalists to understand and portray honestly and resist the temptation and demand in Europe for eroticized fantasies of the harem and slave markets. A uniquely appealing subject for artists and later tourists was the ornately dressed and bristling with arms palace guards, largely symbolic, hearkening back to the golden age of Islam from the 8th to the 13th century. Lastly, will be a detailed look at an extraordinary explorer, linguist, writer, warrior with a razor sharp mind and tongue and the habit of creating enemies wherever he went. Basically, there was nobody like him.